never be afraid. There's nothing which is known which can't be understood. And there's nothing which is understood which can't be explained. For over 50 episodes now, my team and I have brought you to the very frontier of knowledge in physics and astronomy. And still, our mission goes on. To present you with your birthright, an understanding of the universe. I've traveled the world seeking out a certain type of genius. Masters of not only their academic disciplines, but also at explaining their research in understandable ways. And I've bestowed upon these women and men the title of Titanium Physicist. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, L.A. Physique! It's summertime right now, and the campus is hosting a bunch of camps for elementary school kids. It was my pleasure to be invited to give a half dozen talks to these kids, and I talked to them about black holes. In the middle of one of these talks, I got to the topic of event horizons and mentioned the Schwarzschild radius. What's a Schwarzschild radius, they asked, and I explained the clever and tragic story about how Schwarzschild was a soldier in World War I. As he was dying in a hospital bed, he discovered the mathematical model for what we now call a black hole. Okay, but, interrupted one of the children, why do scientists always have such weird names? And I looked at it and I said, it's not weird, and he said, it's spelled weird, and I said, but it only has two syllables. Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild, like Einstein, Einstein. You know, they do have weird names, I told the children. They do have weird names. Their names sound weird to us because they have strange sounds in them. And they have strange sounds in them because they aren't English. You see, I explained, I need you to understand that scientists come from all over the world. Not just England, North America, or Europe, but China, India, Chile, South Africa, everywhere. Science and mathematics belong to all humanity, not because of some beneficence of Western civilization, but because the people from every culture, speaking every language, and of every gender have contributed to the development of science and mathematics. Science and mathematics have only succeeded because everyone has contributed. So when you hear the name of notable scientists, they're going to sound strange to you. They sound strange to everybody. Japanese people have to learn the names of European scientists. Chileans have to learn the names of African scientists. Americans have to learn the names of Asian scientists. It's not a bug. It's a feature. It's not a problem that scientists all have weird-sounding names. It's an acknowledgement of how diverse the history of science is and how science and mathematics doesn't belong to any one nation or ethnicity. Excluding people from the history of science might make the names easier to remember or say, but we can't do without their contributions, so we should honor them by learning to spell their names. Schwarzschild, S-C-H-W-A-R-Z-S-C-H-I-L-D. Okay, maybe I laid it a little thick on those kids, but it's important to me that we appreciate that part of human nature resents having to learn about new things, or it hates relearning a more sophisticated picture of things we already thought we understood pretty well. It makes us feel less knowledgeable, and it makes us feel less relevant. But it's part of ourselves that we just have to push through. We owe it to ourselves to push through it. Speaking of new and more sophisticated understandings, MRI machines are great, but there's an even newer technique with a new acronym that's even better called ESR microscopy. Now, don't get grouchy. I know that you're pretty attached to knowing about MRIs. You even know what their acronym stands for, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. But ESR, Electron Spin Resonance, is even better, and that's the topic of today's show. Speaking of feeling resentful at learning new names, I hate how, now that I don't have time to watch awesome movies twice a month, I no longer have any idea who the popular actors and actresses are. I mean, Channing Tatum? 
What kind of a name is that? What's wrong with just having George Clooney in every movie? You know, he's that guy from ER. Anyway, I digress. Our guest today is an expert on all movies, especially classic movies. She's the host of the 302010 podcast, where they talk about old pop culture uh, from integral multiples of decades ago. Specifically, she's the person who knows all the actors in all the movies ever and can tell you what Jackie Gleason ate for lunch 53 years ago today. Welcome to our show, Diana Goodman. Uh, thank you. It was a ham sandwich. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, Diana, for you today, I've assembled two old favorite titanium physicists. I call them the biophysics team. Arise, Dr. Nicole Prent. Woo, woo, woo. Dr. Nicole got her PhD from the illustrious University of Toronto in biophysics, specializing in nonlinear microscopy. She's a professor of physics at Okanagan College in Vernon, British Columbia. Now, arise, Dr. Jacqueline Townsend. <laughs> Dr. Jacqueline got her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in biophysics. She's currently the lead science faculty at Colorado State University's global campus. All right, Diana, let's talk about magnetic imaging. Okay, so like, have you ever been in an MRI machine or ever seen an MRI machine? In uh, yes. No, I have had an MRI, yeah. Okay, so what's it, what's it like? Um, it's kind of like being locked in a coffin. I mean, I'm in this sort of tube thing. The wall of it is inches from my face. It's making really loud banging and clicking noises. And every now and then some voice comes out of nowhere and says, OK, hold your breath. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm really, really lucky that I do not have claustrophobia. That's great. That's a fantastic experience for what we're going to be talking about today, because the mechanism for ESR, electron spin microscopy, is really similar to the mechanism for MRI machines. Okay. So, it all comes down to magnets. Uh, what was the last time you played with magnets? Um, last time I put something on the fridge, I guess. Okay, cool. Um, did you ever play with, like, bar magnets last time? Oh, yeah. You... Okay, yeah. so that's kind of what we're talking about. So the elementary particles, like electrons and neutrons and protons, they all have magnetic fields. Okay. They all generate magnetic fields. And it's because they have something called spin. Uh, but that's why spin shows up in the electron spin microscopy. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the little magnetic field that the electron generates. Uh, but protons and neutrons uh, both generate them as well. And essentially, it's just like a tiny, 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 tiny little bar magnet. Okay? Okay. So the best example of a bar magnet is like a compass. A compass is just a, a magnet, right? Yeah. It's just a magnet that's encased in fluid or somehow isolated from the rest of the world so that, so that it can spin freely on its axis. And so yeah. it reorients its direction. It's always pointing north because when you put a magnet inside of a, an external magnetic field, it will reorient itself so that it's pointing in the direction of the external magnetic field. Right. That Assuming something else that magnetic isn't nearby, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So an MRI machine, that coffin that you put you in, the, the, the big mm. donut shaped tube. That's just a huge electromagnet. Okay. So what that's doing is it's generating a really, really large magnetic field that points down through the middle of the tube, which is why they tell you to take off all of your jewelry and your pocket magnets and your hammers right, <laughs> before you go into the room. Because once you go into the room with this magnetic field, all this stuff is just going to get pulled towards the magnet and, you know, probably break a window. Okay. Or a wrist or whatever. All right. So that leads to the big obvious question of how does spinning magnets around me be able to see my insides? Right. So let's just imagine a really simple case. Let's imagine that you have a really straightforward magnetic field. All the magnetic field lines are parallel. They're all oriented I don't know, uh, north, why not, huh? So you imagine you take a really big source of a magnetic field, they're, really, they're called solenoids, uh, like the one they put you in in an MRI machine, and that generates a really strong, powerful, uniform magnetic field inside of it. Uh, if you took a little compass and put it on the table inside of it, that compass would reorient itself in the direction of the magnetic field. Okay? Okay. But if you shook it, it wouldn't be oriented towards... The magnetic field anymore. It would be kind of tilted off, right? Mm -hmm. And then it would wiggle back and forth and shed energy because orienting itself in the direction of the magnetic field uh, is the lowest energy state of the system, it's called. Okay. So the system will lose energy and then the magnet will be reoriented in the direction of the magnetic field. So this is essentially what's happening 
Okay, so let's imagine that there's just a single electron with its magnetic field inside our MRI machine, just floating in space. Its magnetic field is going to be oriented in the direction of the external magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So what the scientists do is they hit the electron. They don't hit it with a hammer or a gun the way we would hit a compass. Uh, they shoot a, a little pulse of electromagnetic waves at it. So these electromagnetic waves, they have their own magnetic field, and the magnetic field from the electromagnetic waves perturb the direction that the electron is pointing. So the electron will reorient itself after it's been kind of kicked by this electromagnetic field, and then it will be pointing in another weird direction, because now it has a little bit more energy. But just like the compass needle, eventually it's going to shed the energy and realign itself with the external magnetic field. Does that make sense? Yes. There's, there's two interesting bits here. The first one is that the amount of time it takes for our electron to realign depends on the properties of the electron, the intrinsic properties of the spinning thing. So if it's got a lot mm -hmm. of mass, it's going to take a long time to reorient itself. If it's got a little mass, it'll reorient itself quite quickly. And the second thing is... By looking at the magnetic field produced by this electron, we can detect its orientation. And we can detect when, how much time it takes to reorient itself with that external magnetic field. So what happens is we kick it with a radio wave. It goes off kilter. And then it reorients itself. And then we can detect that reorientation. And we can figure out how much time it took for the atom to reorient itself. And from there, we can deduce properties about this particle. Huh. Does that kind of make okay. sense? Okay. All right. Following you. Yeah. So our bodies are, are more complicated than that. Uh, you know, inside of us, there's all sorts of uh, chemistry going on. That's kind of, I'm kind of afraid of that word, but you have to deal with it in biophysics. <laughs> Me uh, too. I had to take chemistry twice. So <laughs> <laughs> You're twice as afraid of it as I am. But Well, I did not have a good teacher the first time. Uh, you know what, Diana? If it makes you feel better, I had to take chemistry twice too, because I also had a bad teacher the first time, and I ended up publishing papers in international chemistry journals. So, you know, that, that bad experience gets a lot of people. <laughs> oh, wow. That's that that is like seriously inspiring to hear. Yeah. They didn't put you off just because they couldn't explain moralities well. I still don't know what that word means, by the way. Oh, a mole is just a way of saying a certain number. So like a dozen is twelve. Okay. Um a mole is a much larger number. It's six followed by twenty three zeros, give or take. It's like a chemist dozen. A baker's dozen is thirteen. <laughs> yeah, it's like a chemist's dozen. A chemist's dozen is a lot bigger. <laughs> okay, so in our body, there's also right. chemistry. So if you have a, a nucleus, if it's attached to other nucleuses going from an atom to a molecule, then the other nucleuses around them and how they're attached together will determine how much time it takes for that magnetic field from that nucleus to reorient itself with the external magnetic field. So what we see in nuclear mm -hmm. magnetic resonance imaging is... We're looking at how much time it takes for all of these atoms to realign themselves with the uh, external magnetic field. And the amount of time it takes tells us about the local chemistry. And so from there, we could go, okay, that's a spleen. That's a, what other body parts are there? Lung. That's a bone. Bones. Right? <laughs> because all these different body parts, mm -hmm. all these different, uh, the local chemistry of an atom or molecule determines how much time it takes for these things to realign. And so by looking at the realignment time, we can deduce information about what's inside of our bodies. Okay. So let me ask kind of a weird question mm -hmm. then. How do you know where they started from if you're measuring them moving back to normal? Oh, just like if you took a bunch of com compasses and put them in a big external magnetic field, it would take them a little bit of time to shed the energy and realign themselves with the external magnetic field. You could take a body mm -hmm. or whatever and put it inside this big magnet and all the magnets inside of you will realign with this external magnetic field eventually. And so you just have to wait for enough time to pass. And you can say, oh, everything's aligned now. Now it's safe for me to hit it with a, with a pulse, knock everything off kilter, and then see how much time it takes for different parts to realign. Ah, oh, okay. But you're not measuring the position of where they are. You're measuring that energy that's shed in the process. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're not, like, looking at a compass needle, but 
we can measure the energy that is shed by that system as it goes back to normal. Okay. I see. So, yeah, it's sort of once it's n- the the amount of energy being shed is zero, that's back to where it was when it began. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah, so one of the important things in imaging is, of course, having a target. So when we're talking about NMR or ESR, how do we not like image everything? So the key thing with this spin resonance is you need to have something that's unpaired. So when you have a paired system, you end up with no net magnetic field. So if you go back to your compass needle, right, which is a little bar magnet, and you put another bar magnet on top, the opposite poles are going to line up so that this little needle now has no net magnetic field and it's not going to align to the external magnetic field that it's in. And if you perturb it, it's not going to oscillate. It's just going to relax to some other random position. And this goes for both uh, with NMR. This We're talking about the magnetic fields in the nucleus. Um, and then we'll learn from Jacqueline about with ESR, how we're talking about the magnetic fields from the spinning electrons. Okay. So yeah, so this pairing makes the perturbation impossible. So we can get targeted by targeting these certain nuclei or these electrons that are unpaired. That's what's special about them. Okay, I think I'm following. All right. Let's reiterate. So at the start, I was like, let's just imagine one all by itself. The Mm -hmm. the magnetic fields produced by any two electrons is going to be about the same. Well, it's going to be the same because electrons are pretty much identical. Oh, the same. So if if I had two Mm -hmm. bar magnets and I put them close to each other, what would they do? They'll stick together if they've got opposite charges. Right, right. they stick together. But how do they stick together? Do they stick together in a way where both of their norths are stick together and both of their souths are stuck together? No, it'd be the opposite, wouldn't it? Exactly. So the north sticks to the south and the south sticks to the north. And what you end up with is Mm -hmm. these two bar magnets are interacting with each other really strongly, but then overall, Mm -hmm. they kind of cancel each other out. So once you've stuck those two magnets together... Their magnetic fields are canceling out with each other, and the system isn't really producing a magnetic field, and the system isn't really interacting with external magnetic fields. So if if you have these two electrons and you make them cuddle up, they're going to invert so that one is pointed down and one pointed up, or so that their magnetic fields Mm -hmm. cuddle up and cancel out. And then after that, you can't perturb them, and they're kind of coupled off. They don't really care about that big external magnetic field, so they won't necessarily Mm -hmm. realign themselves all the time with this external magnetic field. Oh, okay. okay. So if if you have one alone magnet, hey, all this story I've told you is perfect. If you have two, Nicole is saying that they won't really care if they're in a big magnetic field, and they won't really care if you hit them with a radio wave. And the important thing here is that every molecule has more than two electrons in it. Almost every nucleus has more than two nucleons in them. It's really common to see Mm -hmm. these magnetic uh, objects cuddled up close together. And so if they pair up, you're not going to be able to use your magnetic perturbation trick to see what they're made out of if they're cuddled up. Okay. So where does that apply to uh, imaging? Kind of where we're going with this whole cuddling magnets and non-cuddling magnets is getting into a discussion of the differences between NMR, which is the nuclear magnetic resonance, which is used in MRI, versus ESR, which is the electron spin resonance, which is what we're going to be elaborating on going forward in this discussion. So with NMR, we have the concept of isotopes, which I know most Mm -hmm. people have probably heard of isotopes, but don't necessarily have a full understanding of what they are. With isotopes, it comes down to how many neutrons are in a nucleus. And as far as the NMR techniques care if there is an even number of protons and neutrons, then it's not going to react. But if there's an odd number, then we have the lone spin that will be detected. But because in a population of atoms, you're going to have some isotopes. So even if I normally have an even number, some of my isotopes are going to be odd and vice versa. So NMR is less selective because you're always going to have some odd and some even in your population. So it's harder to get a perfectly clean signal. And when you're looking at bodies, that can be useful because you want to be able to look at a bunch of different atoms in someone's body. Like if you're looking at something that's going on with their bones, 
you know, you can say, okay, I'm going to try and look at this whole population of atoms in a bone. And depending on how you process the signal afterwards is how you get information from that. And there's also contrast dyes that you can kind of hone mm -hmm. in on that will help make that be a little more specific because with NMR you're getting a more generalized signal because you're looking at a lot of atoms, which is good for certain purposes. Okay, yeah, that's something I, I actually I would love to know, even though I'm worried it's a little off topic. So I once had a kidney infection and they did a CAT scan and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Then they did a CAT scan with contrast and all of a sudden it was really obvious what was going on. And I always wondered what exactly the contrast made it able for them to see that me screaming and going, ah, my kidneys couldn't. Yeah, CAT scan gets into x-rays, which kind of uh, work in a, in a different way. So yeah. Yeah, they're absorbing. <laughs> yeah, contrast dyes work different in MRIs too. But basically in either case, um, when they put a contrast dye, they're usually putting in some kind of really heavy atom, like not radioactive, hmm. but, but like boron or something that is a really big solid atom with a big solid signal. In either of those cases, it helps them more clearly identify what they're looking oh. for. Oh, well, that makes sense. So it's, it's kind of like, like if you have a bunch of tiny magnets in your body, normally they're putting a bunch of bigger magnets in your body. Right. So they react more strongly. Yeah, and with your CAT scan, it's more like t d density, like tissue density. Mm hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was always always wondered how that worked. Mm -hmm. um, didn't think to ask at the time because, like I said, I was in a lot of pain. It's not a fun time to have those discussions, but then afterwards, sometimes it's like, oh, what were they doing? Yeah. It's like, well, they made me drink a milkshake. Then I had to go do this again. Then I threw up the milkshake. Uh. Aww. Yeah. It was a bad time. Yeah, kidneys are jerks. What I learned from the entire experience was kidneys are jerks. Kidneys are jerks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so talking when we're talking about NMR, that's the nuclear magnetic resonance. And if you remember from your high school chemistry classes, the nucleus is the big thing in the middle of the atom with the protons and neutrons in it. And the electrons are those really, really, really tiny things that aren't quite a particle and aren't quite a wave and they're kind of circling around in an orbit around the atom. Yeah, that I held on to. I remember that part. <laughs> yeah, so when we're doing NMR, we're looking at the big thing in the center of the atom. And we're doing ESR, we're getting a signal from those little guys that are orbiting around. But again, so like so like Nicole was explaining about how if you have a pair of bar magnets, they kind of cancel each other out. The same thing works with electrons, and even though they all have a negative charge, they have this property called spin that behaves in a similar way. So if you have an electron with an upspin and an electron with a downspin, it'll kind of cancel each other out as far as its interaction with an external magnetic field goes. You know, some people might remember from high school chemistry if you're doing the let's fill in the orbitals and they make you draw the little up arrow and the little down arrow. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> In high school chemistry, when you're filling out the orbitals, you fill out from the innermost to the outermost. And each orbital uh, that an electron can live in takes two electrons, right? Right. I, I remember that there's the different levels around the nucleus. And it was it was like two electrons in the first level. And then when that level's full, it That's goes right. out to the next one. It's yep. always two because of uh, Pauli exclusion principle, it's called. So Pauli exclusion principle says mm -hmm. kind of there are these orbitals and you can't put too many electrons in one orbital. But you're allowed two in each because one of them is spin up and the other spin down. So you could put two oh, in each orbital, but when there are two in each orbital, their magnetic fields are going to cancel out. Ah, okay. okay. Got it. And then sometimes when you're filling out those orbitals, sometimes you have one left over, depending mm -hmm. on what kind of atom you're working with. And that one left over can interact with a magnetic field in the same way that a nucleus with an odd spin number can interact with a 
a magnetic field. But when we're detecting it, we're detecting it a much smaller signal at a much higher frequency because we're going to really, really, really the limits of what we can measure. Right. So you're going for one tiny individual electron at the outside of an atom instead of the big bulky main part of the atom, right? Exactly. And the other interesting thing is that these are much rarer in biological systems than a nucleus that is going to interact with the magnetic field is. And that's because of getting into the chemistry word, covalent. Covalent bonds. Yeah. Yeah, like the free electrons are very reactive. And essentially, in biology, they react themselves out of existence. You can kind of think of it that way. Um, So when you find one, it's really special, right? So you can hone in on it. This is some of the stuff that Jacqueline does where you can add these special tags that might be reactive. And the the key thing is finding a stable reactive species. So one that will actually let this free electron exist for a while so you can probe it. Hmm. I think we need to emphasize the point you're making here. We need to back up the train. There are obviously some atoms that have an odd number of electrons, right? And so they're going to have a lonely, unpaired electron that we should be able to detect with this. So ESR, it shouldn't be hard to see atoms with free electrons. But if we're talking about biological systems, everything's molecules, right? These molecules are attached together using something called a covalent bond. Some atoms, when they're making molecules, they attach together by sharing electrons. So what this means essentially is that when they're close enough together, the electrons stop orbiting one atom alone and start kind of orbiting both. Uh, And in the process of doing this, lots of these free electrons uh, will pair up. And so in Mm -hmm. molecules, it's kind of rare to see, especially in biological systems where it's just full of body chemistry, uh, it's it's really rare to see solo electrons because uh, if it's got a solo electron, it'll stick to something. Something else will want to share its electron in a covalent bond. And so mm-hmm. there's lots and lots of covalent bonds, but anytime two atoms with an odd number of electrons get in a covalent bond, their electrons pair off and become invisible to ESR. Okay, I think I'm getting this. So the idea is that hypothetically, you know, finding the lone electron should be pretty easy, but because we're dealing with a body, you know, it's not deep space, it's a body that are already complicated and full of goofy chemistry there aren't a lot of them to find. Yes, like electrons basically govern the chemistry of right. uh, the atom and the molecule once you put them all together, and that's how you get your your reactions. Well, free radicals um, generally are something like people like to avoid. You've probably heard of antioxidants, and so mm-hmm. people take those to sort of get rid of these reactive uh, species. In general, though, like our body has lots of uh, ways to combat them naturally as well. Hence the reason why these lone electrons are extremely rare. Okay. So is a free radical one of these atoms that has the lone electron? You got her. That's why it's reactive with stuff because it has just the one electron. So it's looking for a buddy. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the cool thing is, is because these are rare... We can take advantage of that when Mm -hmm. we're studying biological systems in a way that we can't with NMR because nuclei that react with magnetic fields are common, but electrons that that react with magnetic fields are rare. And both of those properties can be taken advantage of in different ways. So so now I'm going to get into protein chemistry. So we're getting lots of fun chemistry review in this physics podcast today. So I was a cinema major for a reason. <laughs> so nothing to do with chemistry. But you can be both like Hedy Lamar. Uh, that's true. She invented a new kind of radar, mm-hmm. which is actually what's used to tune the frequencies for ESR. Really? So there's a connection there. Yep. Huh. Not her specific technique, but a lot of the radar physics that was developed by people, including Hedy Lamar, is used to tune the radio frequencies, admittedly at a much higher frequency for techniques like ESR and NMR. Mm-hmm. That is really neat. I knew that, yeah, the frequency hopping thing is used in, in like, Wi-Fi, but I didn't know it was, huh. Yeah, Hedy Lamar was really cool. So yeah. cin- cinema and chemistry are not mutually exclusive, necessarily. Okay, so I was going to explain about protein chemistry. Most of what's going on in your body involves proteins 
either acting as a structural element or doing stuff. So there's your bones, which are largely mineral, but aside from your bones um, and, and the lipids making up membranes that are kind of like holding all the sacs of cells together, a lot of what's going on in your body is either structural proteins. So like your muscles doing stuff is proteins. Like most people are used to like, oh, I should eat a lot of protein because it makes muscles. There's also what's called enzymes, which are the molecules that do most of the life things that happen. So when you eat something, it's broken apart by enzymes. When you're growing up and lots of stuff is getting built, it's enzymes that are putting it together. So these enzymes are making most of the life happen. Um, and so enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. Does that make sense? Yep. Got it. Okay. Enzymes are proteins that do stuff. And all proteins are made up of these things called amino acids, which are basically kind of like Legos that build up proteins. And they come in certain fixed shapes. Mm -hmm. um, so you know how like Legos have the round bit that sticks out and then the other end that you stick the round bits into? Mm -hmm. Amino acids kind of work in the same way but in a line. You can't branch them out. You build them basically as a long sequence of different pieces. So like if you had Lego that could only have one Lego stacked on top of it, but you could have a bunch of different heights of Legos and shapes of Legos stacked on top of it really, really long, okay. like a necklace. Here's the tricky part. And this is actually still one of the hardest problems in biology and medical science and biophysics that like literally hundreds of scientists are working on this problem. It's called the protein folding problem. Because once we have this long line of amino acids, it coils up on itself and folds into a very specific three-dimensional shape that is dictated by those building blocks that were put into it. Mm -hmm. And we don't know all of the rules that dictate how that happens because there's so many different variables and ways that things could be folded up. It's like staring at a piece of paper and trying to figure out what origami you could fold it into. It is a really, really difficult problem. It's kind of like looking at a string and thinking about how, like, you can make a sweater out of it, or you can make, like, two sweaters yeah, out of it, it is. stuck together so there's only necks and arms, <laughs> right? It's like... Yeah, like, maybe it's going to be a slipper, maybe it's going to be a earmuffs, like, who knows? Like, who knows? Just a big ball hmm. mess. Yeah, the, the cool thing is, is they, they fold up into these very specific shapes, and these shapes are what dictate what they're able to do. So, you know, you have your Legos and you build a little Lego boat. It's a little Lego boat. And you have your proteins. Like, I'm going to build this sequence of amino acids. And it makes a very specific protein that might be an enzyme that has a very specific function. Mm -hmm. So you're probably thinking, okay, but how do we get from, like, little spinning electrons? And what does this have to do with the proteins folding up, right? Yeah. So... <laughs> So a cool trick we can do is add a specific building block called a cysteine. We can make a tiny little mutation in that protein and put a cysteine in. And a cysteine has an atom on it called a sulfur that we can make a covalent bond with one of these electron spin labels. There's very certain molecules that can kind of keep that lone electron trapped in a stabilized mm -hmm. state. And so we can add those onto a protein or an enzyme. And so now we've labeled it and we can do ESR on it. Hmm. So why do we want to bother with all that? The even cooler thing is, is now that we have this protein with a label in a very specific spot and we know exactly where in the sequence that is, we can do ESR and get information about that molecule. Okay. Yes, because remember the... You got information on its environment based on the, the energy and the relaxation time. Right. So now you can actually see that even though in its sort of natural state, it wouldn't have the free electron to make it visible to ESR. Oh, stupid analogy time. Okay, so it's like you got your yarn. It's just like a long protein chain. And you put jingle bells on your yarn. And then you let it make itself into a sweater. 
and you look at where they're jingling, and depending, you know, what the bell in the armpit's not going to make much sound. <laughs> the bell on the ends are going to make a ton of sound. And so that based on looking at where the jingle bells are and how they sound, you can tell what shape the sweater's in, or rather that it's, it's a sweater at all. Okay. That's an okay analogy. It's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, I'm loving imagining this, like, ball of yarn knitting itself into a sweater while someone's, like, hiding in the other room. Like, I can't wait to see what happens. I mean, that's that's kind of not far off. I'm kind of going to go back to the less jingly explanation now. Um, so if we have the labels on the protein, we can get a lot of information about the shape of the protein. And then we can do other things to it. So say I want to design a medication that targets an enzyme like say oh this you know there's too much of this enzyme i want to make something that binds to it you can then say okay i'm gonna do esr on the molecule all by itself just kind of floating in a little tube and see what shape that is mm -hmm. and then add the drug to it and look at it again and see if the shape changed. Like, did it bind? If so, what shape did it bind? How did it change the shape? And that's really important information for things like drug design. Like if you're trying to design a medication for something. It's also useful for, like I said, this protein folding problem is this big, huge question. It's kind of like people talk about the Hadron Collider is like this big, you know, in physics, we're trying to finish out our atomic model. Like... The protein folding problem is the big question in biophysics is trying to figure out the rules that govern how proteins fold up because that is going to open up a big world of understanding of things like how do we dis design better drugs to help cure diseases better and stuff like that. Um, hmm. So we can do things like there's chemicals you can use to unfold a protein and then you can look at it and kind of watch it folding back up again. And you may not get a hundred percent of the picture, but you'll get part of the picture. That's, you know, it's a piece of a very big puzzle that's useful. Um, one of the other really important things that's being used for is, and this ties into part of why one of the many reasons the protein folding problem is so important is that there's an entire class of diseases called protein misfolding disorders that are diseases hmm. that are caused by a protein folding wrong and we don't know why the protein is folding wrong and it causes a disease and the one that almost everybody has probably heard of is alzheimer's oh so a protein starts folding wrong and so it's no longer working correctly yeah. Is that right? So it's it's no longer folding correctly. Um, and when some proteins start folding incorrectly, that tends to kind of trigger this cascading event that makes other proteins fold wrong around it. And so you can get an accumulation. So like when they talk about plaques, like Alzheimer's plaques. Oh, I see. Those are actually clumps of misfolded proteins that are accumulating in your neurons. Oh. And so that's why studying this is so important. Yeah. So we've gone all the way from your MRI machine through the, the nasty weeds of chemistry, and we've come back out to, like, this is how scientists are studying things like Alzheimer's. Okay. I feel like I'm following along. Cool. <laughs> I think. Okay. So, I mean, that kind of answers the big overall question is, yeah, what can ESR be used for? So Alzheimer's is a big one. You know, potentially looking at, you know, what sort of environmental conditions maybe slow down this folding, speed up the folding, you know, maybe help them fold correctly again. You know, looking at these conditions is actually really informative. Um, so Alzheimer's is the big one right now. There's, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, drug design is, is key. Um, the overall protein folding problem. There's also some other kind of less my area of expertise. But there's applications in quantum computing. Oh. Yeah. So because we're getting into the funky quantum world, so it has applications for fuzzy circuits in quantum computing and things like measuring the amount of radiation that someone's been exposed to. Um, so like mm. after the Fukushima incident, they can take a tiny chip of tooth enamel and use ESR because the irradiation causes free radicals in tooth enamel that you can use to measure how much radiation someone's been exposed to. The more you've been exposed to ionizing radiation, the more free radicals are in your body. And they, they look at tooth enamel. Because they stay in your tooth enamel. 
But that's bananas. There's also, I think, a link between the free radicals and cancer, too. Right. At, you know, reacting with DNA and interfering with your natural end life for cells, your cell apto- apoptosis. So, unlike NMR, we're not going to be sticking you in an ESR machine anytime soon because mm. as i mentioned we're we're looking at much smaller signals you know you you you've had your nmr before you usually you're usually in that big loud thumping thing for a while yeah. i think i had one done and i was in there for like an hour so when we we put a sample in the esr machine because we're looking for much weaker samples we have to run them for a lot longer so my samples are usually in there for about a week So we're not using this on people anytime soon because, you know, we're looking for such smaller things. We have to run the experiments a lot longer. Um, We're still very early days. So so Ben was saying like the 5, 10, 30, you know, we're kind of at the very early days of ESR relative to NMR. But 30 years from now, you know, maybe we're using ESR to look at things like Alzheimer's progression or, you know, DNA damage for cancer risk or things like that. Like, who knows? It's it's very exciting early technology. Diana, in 30 years' time on your podcast, hmm. you can be like, well, you know that thing that everybody goes into, the fancy EMR <laughs> machines? 30 years ago, I was on that very popular podcast right before that guy uh, got really famous <laughs> for that. You know, <laughs> Diana, did you have any other questions? No, I think that about covers it. I understand what it's for, how it works, and the kind of the scientific principles behind it. Um, I also understand, yeah, why it doesn't work very well on people, even besides the amount of time, because there aren't as many free electrons running around in your body. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you're heading in a direction to be able to kind of introduce them or tag them in a way. So yeah, maybe one day there could be an ESR sort of scan for peeps. Well, that was fun. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Jacqueline. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit and that fruit is sweet. Here is the proteinous fruit I could look up. Nicole, you get a soybean. Yum, yum. Chomp, chomp. All right. And Jacqueline, you get a peanut. Crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> Wait, are are peanuts fruit? <laughs> Technically, they're legumes. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guest, Diana Goodman, host of 302010. Thank you for coming on the show, Diana. Thank you for having me, and thank you for, for taking the time to explain everything. I, I, feel, I feel empowered with knowledge now. I'm not going to go tell other people about it and probably get it all wrong. Okay. All right, everybody. That was super fun. And now it's announcement time. So first, I'd like to ask you to give us an iTunes review or tell other people about us online. Why? Because lots of people love physics, but nobody knows about our show, relatively. So, people find out about our show, maybe they'll want to listen. And then maybe they'll want to talk to you about physics. And then everybody will be happy and physics-y. On another note, we're still humbly soliciting your donations. Your donations go to paying our server fees and our project to transcribe the episodes as they come out and fix up the website and buy people microphones. And thank you very much. You can send one-time donations through PayPal off of our website, or you can go to our sweet Patreon site and give a recurring $2 donation. This particular episode of The Titanium Physicist has been sponsored by a collection of generous people. I'd like to start by thanking the generosity of John Edelman for his donation. I'd also like to thank Janico Freifenberg, Steve Smethurst, Magnus Christensen, Bart Gladys, and Mr. Stuart Pollock, our Emperor Courtney Burke Davis, Mr. David Lindels, Mr. Carl Lockhart, and our eternal friend B.S., and Randy Dalzel, a Miss Tina Raudio, The Enigmatic Ryan, a gentleman named Crux, and Gabe and Evan Weens. David D. and Dan Vale, a Mr. Alex. WTL, Mr. Per Proden. Andrew Waddington, Mr. Jordan Young. And John Bleasy, a Brittany Crooks. James Crawford, Mr. Mark Simon. Tucson's Gang of One, Mr. Lawrence Lee. Sixton Linnison, 
Mr. Simon, Keegan Ede, Adrian Schoenig, Andreas from Knoxville, Cadby, John Campbell, Alexandra Zani is great, Winna Brett, Eric Deutsch, Etienne, and a gentleman named Peter Fan, Gareth Eason, Joe Piston, David Johnson, and Anthony Leon, as well as Doug B., Julia, Noah Robertson, Ian and Stu, a Mr. Frank, Philip from Austria, and Noisy Mom, Mr. Shlomo Dalal, Melissa Burke, Yassin Urzazi, Spider Rogue, Insanity Orbits, Robin Johnson, Madame Sandra Johnson, Mr. Jacob Wick, Mr. John Keyes, a Mr. Victor C., Ryan Close, Peter Clipsham, Mr. Robert Halpin, Elizabeth Teresa, and Paul Carr, a Mr. Ryan Newell, Mr. Adam K., Thomas Shai Ray, a Mr. Jacob S., a gentleman named Brett Evans, a lady named Jill, a gentleman named Greg, thanks Steve, Mr. James Clausen, Mr. Devin North, a gentleman named Scott, Ed Lowlington, Kelly Wienersmith, Jocelyn Reed, and Mr. S. Hatcher, a Mr. Rob Abrazado, and Mr. Robert Stietka. That's it for Tie Fi this time. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, there are lots of other lovely shows on the Brachylope Media Network. The intro song to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. Good day, my friends, and until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. to tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hopped down I always like to think of that Star Trek scanner, the all-encompassing just... Oh, yeah, you okay. just run it over oh, again. Know. It's doing Dr. McCoy's it's scanner. The same time. Yeah. It occurred yeah. to me. Oh, wait, no, that wouldn't work. Yeah, Ooh, that's pretty good. Do- Dr. To- McCoy's... But, like, okay, so that thing, the, the, the they always have... Well, I always the, think... Yeah. <laughs> what were you saying? Hello? I was just saying, like, Dr. McCoy's scanner's got to have, like, X-ray, ESR, NMR, probably some stuff we haven't even thought of yet. Well, like, it's a the medical everything. tricorder's got, like, a thing yeah, that they're scanning you with, right? Yeah. But it's got to be reflecting off your bones and guts and, you know, blood cells. Yeah, it's taking all it's, those signals. But, like, the, like, the intensity of that beam that it's hitting you with must be bananas, right? Because it's not like it's passing through you and you're detecting, like, ambient absorption. You're detecting backscatter off it. True, but you're also thinking about modern technology, too, right? As you go deep, you get more sensitive. Maybe you can isolate those background noises. Like, obviously, like, there are some huge technological problems with the scanner. <laughs> but, yeah. well, the fact that it's held in a shaky human hand is kind of the one that always bothered me. Yeah. Like, I'm x-raying B. Yeah. Oh, he's broke his leg. It's like, but your hand was all over. <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be, like, a display, really. Like, I love that. How do, how I love it? rewatching Star Trek know what Next it's Generation at? because everybody glosses over what they're looking at on their little pads. They just look like down. It's not on camera and you're like, oh, I wonder what they're seeing. <laughs>